Hi guys, welcome to another Caternix Corner Live. I hope everyone is doing great tonight. Um, today we're going to be talking about winterizing your quail, uh, your enclosures, the birds, uh, to keep them safe during the cold winter season. Um, with me today is Tanya Slutcher Long, and she has one of the most elaborate aviary setups that I've ever seen. Welcome, Tanya. And you can answer your phone if you want. <laughs> It's not important. Um, not a problem. Uh, Tanya is going to be sharing her setup with us today, guys, and talking about what she does um, to get her birds and her enclosures ready for winter. Um, we will be taking your questions uh, later on in the group. Uh, so if you would, type the letter Q in front of your questions. Uh, it just helps me find them a little bit easier over the comments. I do have a couple quick announcements that I want to make before we get started. Uh, first off, big shout out to our sponsors, uh, Hatching Time and Southwest Game Birds. Um, if you use the coupon code Caternix Corner over at Southwest Game Birds, you can get 10% off of any purchase over there. And Hatching Time has donated another $50 gift certificate, uh, which we'll be giving away tonight. And uh, you can use that over on their website um, towards any purchase of... Uh, equipment or whatnot that they've got over there so um let's see what else uh oh the, the video that i'm working on now which i told you about last week the uh, hatching time cages with the new uh flooring setup and hit and my phone goes off <laughs> unbelievable um it's currently being edited so keep an eye out for that guys it should be ready in a day or so um we had a, a little uh, celebration type deal over on our Facebook uh, group page. Um, we reached 20,000 members, which to me is unbelievable. Uh, and we did a little uh, 20K, uh, or congrats 20K celebration, which we posted on the uh, website. And we got a lot of comments on that. So guys, I appreciate all your comments on that. And we are going to be announcing the winner of the three prizes. Um, at the end of tonight's show, so stick around for that. Um, we are giving away a Caternix Corner Tumbler, a 30 count of hatching eggs from Southwest Game Birds, and a $50 gift certificate from Hatching Time. So I also want to thank our moderator, Beth Reed. Um, I appreciate everything she does. Uh, she kind of keeps everything going and kind of in line here, post links and whatnot, so really appreciate that. Um, I did have uh, one thing that I was going to read, but I'm not going to, uh, it was more like a rant, but there's, there's one part of it that I do want to bring up real quick, and I'll try to make it as fast as possible. Um, it was brought to my attention that some of the guests on Caternix Corner Live were speaking on subjects that were more advanced in nature and using terminology that many people might not understand. I just want to say that Caternix Corner was created for everyone in the, uh, the kale, quail community um, to share information, no matter what the skill level might be. Um, so whether it's basics or advanced subjects like genetics, um, I wanna make that available to everyone. I'm not gonna exclude a certain group of people from the live stream uh, just because the subject matter is too advanced for some people to comprehend, and I fall into a lot of those categories. Um, but I think that most people would be appreciative, appreciative of them sharing that information because as you grow and you know become more advanced um, you're gonna have something that you can look back on you know so I, I think you should really be you know happy that these people are coming on also um, I remember talking with Perry Schofield and Robbie Richard uh, years ago and they were telling me that you know back in their day there was no information out there the, this level of of information that's available to us wasn't even heard of you know back when they, they got into it so you know guys just keep kind of keep that in mind um like i said i'm not going to exclude anybody from coming on the live show just because i think the information might be over you know some people's heads including my own so uh that's about it for that i was going to go into something else but i think i'm just gonna bite my tongue on that one um 
yeah, that's about it out of me. Tanya, if you're ready, we will go ahead and uh, let you take center stage. All set, Terry. Um, I uh, want to first thank you for having me back Absolutely. and uh, thanking everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I, uh, for those of you that may have tuned in to my previous broadcast, I do raise uh, quail and other livestock, birds, etc., in a large aviary setting. And I am located in southern Indiana, um, part of the Midwest, I guess. And uh, here we have weather that is extremely variable. So uh, we typically get our first freezing temperatures and frost around the end of October to mid-November. And then our last frost and freezing uh, can be as late as Mother's Day. Um, I've had the birds in the aviary setting now for going on into our third year. And uh, temperatures have been anywhere from you know 50 degrees dropping down into the teens um, and even to zero and below wind chills at some time um, we have uh, been lucky that we've had very light snow um, we've not had really heavy snowfall or really heavy ice since I've had the aviary um, but those events that we have had, we've been very lucky um, that uh, I have not uh, lost a significant amount of birds. Um, we achieve this by uh, lots of preparation. Um, my preparation starts usually in late September um, where we uh, do our last cleaning we start removing any birds that we don't think will uh, have as good a chance to survive. So anyone that is injured um, or may have had a uh, defect from hatch, as well as any extra males, etc., cetera, um, we will go ahead and call them and get our numbers down to a more manageable size uh, well before the first three sets. Um, Terry, you can go ahead and uh, start loading some of the photos. Absolutely. And um, this is uh, one of the before pictures that I took over the weekend. Um, we have mainly dirt, and uh, then I usually spread mulch uh, throughout the year as needed um, as far as the base of the aviary. And then we have several plantings um, that some survive the birds in the winter, others have to be reworked uh, when springtime comes. Um, but at this point you can see I have not uh, done much in the way of cleaning and maintenance. We uh, had a lot of the mulch break down over the summer and so it was time to go in and do um, a good cleaning. Um, I. Uh, purchased a small tiller a uh, couple of years ago when we started uh, with our garden and with the aviary. Um, I think it cost about $100 and uh, we take that out, plug it in and do a good turning of the soil, uh, usually about three to four times throughout the year um, and then add fresh mulch as necessary. <coughs> Um, we also, you can see in the background, I have uh, hooked up a uh, run electric outlet and hooked up a heated waterer um, for the birds as well as part of my winter preparation. And uh, Terry, you can move on to the next photo. Um, we have several hideaways um, in the aviary. Uh, which what you see on the right side is a smaller pergola style aviary um, that's in the middle uh, of the larger area and that houses my parakeets and my single button quail as well as um, my son's three guinea pigs. 
Um, they have uh, both outdoor and an enclosed indoor area, and we do keep a thermostatically controlled heater on the indoor portion of that area. Um, to the left, you see uh, there's a patio bench that I have made into a hideaway. And we have a couple of bunny hutches um, that are starting to see uh, longer than uh, normal usage and will probably be replaced uh, sometime next year. Um, in the middle of the hutches, I have the cover for my feeders uh, to try to keep those from getting wet in the rain. And uh, you can move on to the next photo, Terry. Um, this is the other side, which was my original chicken area. Uh, in the cages on top, I have my rabbits. And then the ground area there is uh, used for, currently for my turkeys um, that will be in there for a couple of more weeks. And then uh, when I don't have my turkeys in there, um, if we have baby rabbits, we typically put them on the ground until they're ready to be processed. Um, again, this is an area that uh, we turn it as needed, clean it up in between the different animals being out there. And uh, then I have heated waterers <clears throat> for the rabbits um, during the winter time as well. And we can go to the next. Uh, this is just another uh, before picture. Um, where you can see there is a little more mulch in this area um, and another picture of the hideaway and of course <coughs> this is a uh, group of the remaining quail that will be overwintered. Uh, this is the first after picture. You can tell we've already turned the soil in this picture. Um, I also uh, emptied the leaves out of the aviary netting that had collected and we turned those over as well and I uh, cleaned out and added uh, sand to their little area there so that they would have a sand bath fresh for the uh, winter time as well. Uh, I always uh, try to add uh, a couple of bales of straw. Um, this bale we broke up and uh, you can see I've added straw to the uh, hutches as well as the main coop area. And then I left this part of the broken bale out and they have, uh, since that photo, they have spread it out a little bit more and uh, made an area uh, to jump in. I don't, and we added around the snowball bush as well um, with their hideaway and all of that. I try not to break apart and use straw as bedding all over the aviary. I did this in the area where you saw the turkeys my first year raising chickens and straw does not break down completely and when it gets wet uh, just like pine shavings as well it will collect into a dense mat of material and it's very difficult to clean up and remove that and removal has to be done a lot more often than with the uh, mulch over the soil. Um, you can tell this is a, a, a large flower pot base that I found at a hardware store. And uh, we it was one of my first hideaways and we cut a little hole out in it and it's one of the birds favorite places to uh, go into behind that snowball bush. They're having a really good time with the, 
the fresh straw and everything that we put down over the weekend. And this is just another photo. We uh, rearranged the furniture, so to speak, and uh, I moved the patio bench over, and you can see I filled it with fresh straw um, so that when they go in there, they can burrow and hide and, and get some warmth inside. And uh, just another photo and uh, of the uh, broken bale before they got in there. And again, I filled those hutches up pretty full with straw because they will drag some out. And um, I try to leave just an opening so that they can get in there and burrow around and dig and find a good place to hide. Um, again, just the, uh, the snowball bush area, we uh, covered this with timbers, so it does, it is boxed in and kind of holds the straw more together, so when we get ready to remove it, it's a little easier removal than having it all over the aviary. Um, in the background to the right, you can see an unbroken bale of straw. I basically uh, put that in there with enough room so that it serves as somewhat of a weather break and they can get behind it and huddle up or uh, the larger birds can climb up and roost on top wherever they prefer. And then to the <coughs> left, you see what was one of my uh, smaller coops um, that I have left in there for the, the birds in the aviary. And again, we filled it with fresh straw and got it ready so that they can go in there up off the ground as well. Um, a lot of the birds choose to sleep and roost underneath that particular enclosure. And here's just another one of uh, showing um, after we got the straw spread where several of the quail went in to uh, check out their their new surroundings. Um, the Rochelle Farm says if Mr. Muddy is going to be going to comment in the background he needs to be on air. <laughs> <laughs> so you better squeeze him in there with you Tanya. I tried to get him to join me, but he prefers to be a bystander. I don't blame him. Um, do your birds come out, like when you get real heavy snows, do they come out and play in the snow at all? or? Yes, yeah, my, my <laughs> birds basically uh, stay outside regardless of the weather. Um, even the uh, parakeets uh, will uh, be seen in the outside portion when it's down in the teens and the 20s. So you, you get down in the low teens and 20s and whatnot up yes. there in India? Wow. Cool. Do you, do you do anything to keep the snow from getting in there? I mean, do you cover it or? Uh, well, we had a lot of it uh, collected on the netting itself. Right. Um, some fell through to the ground, but we've not had a heavy enough snow that I've had to go in there and, and shovel it out, so to speak. Right. We have had the gate get frozen shut, and so I've had some times that I could not get in there. That's why I try to make sure that they have enough food and water and everything that they could be okay for a couple of days if necessary. Sure. Do you, what do you do for frozen water? Is that what that uh, outlet was for, is to keep it warm? Yeah, I've got a, a heated water, um, and uh, we leave it plugged up to the outlet. Okay, cool. I wish I would have in included that picture. I didn't even know what it was, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> uh, okay, um, we can go ahead, uh, unless you've got any more, you want to jump in and take some questions? or? I, like I said, I'm, I'm ready for questions. Okay, uh, I'm just going to stop start right at the top, because that's where my... Thing is now and just read everybody's out real quick because we don't have a whole lot in there so uh, Butch Garner says howdy uh, from Indiana says he forgot to set his clock back and of course Kiki's in the house she says uh, front row seat and we have little duck in the house 
Kathy White is in from California. Beth Reed says hello everyone. Uh, Tanya Faraway Farm says heck yeah. We got a whole bunch of uh, waving hands here. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Maybe you can figure this one out. Uh, Rainbow Magic Treasure Chest said there's a fetus and a keeks and a Kathy party time. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, that's BYC speak. <laughs> ah, I gotcha. Uh, Rebecca says shout out from Texas. Beth Reed says remember to put a Q in front of your questions uh, for tonight. Appreciate that, uh, Beth. Little Duck is here from the Bermuda Triangle. Cool. Let's see. Kiki says Rev will be moved to the doghouse if he doesn't show up. And four B one K one is here. Uh, let's see. Alyssa G says Keeks Rev B Muds Jaff is here too. You guys got a whole bunch of cute little names going on. <laughs> uh, yo, Mima. Okay, let me skip up here. <clears throat> uh, Jeff says hello from Central Missouri. Klaus is joining us from the Netherlands. Hello, everyone. Hello. Glad you can make it, Klaus. <coughs> Tim says, hey, everyone. <coughs> Frederick says, hello, from Delaware. I don't know who Santa is, but hello, Santa. <laughs> JL Murphy says, up late again, Klaus. Kiki says, hi, Mayor. Jasmine Bass is in the house. She says, hi, Beth. Um, as a matter of fact, Jasmine may be coming on the show not next week Tuesday but the following Tuesday so keep an eye out for that one Jesse Mills says good evening everyone good evening Jesse thanks for joining us Butch Garner says howdy Lisa says hi Keeks <laughs> and let's see here we go don't forget to hit the like button yep Iva Joe says hello from northern Wisconsin Tanya Faraway Farms Clap hands. Uh, let's see. LaRonda says hello from Northern California. Kiki says Houston Hot Texas is here. Okay. Katrina's in the house. Says hi to everyone from Gilroy, California. Um, Tanya says hello from Central Oregon. Mary from Woodland Farm in Iowa. Hello, Mary. Welcome. Klaus says he always finds time for the show. I appreciate that, Klaus. Um, guys, Klaus is going to be here next week. He is going to be talking about what is turning out to be kind of a controversial subject. Um, they've been doing some research on uh, the Celadon gene and are going to be presenting some findings. Uh, on the possible issues with the Celadon gene, so join us for that one. Shelly is here from Worcester, Ohio. Salvador, hi Terry and everyone from Puerto Rico. Welcome Salvador, glad, glad you could check in. Matthew says hey all from Paw Paw, Michigan. <laughs> Kiki says it's me calling you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Beth says, everyone, please hit the subscribe and hit the notification bell. Um, I appreciate it, guys. We are up to just about to 29,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is another one that blows my mind. Okay, we got a question here from Brody uh, Brizendine. Sorry if I didn't butcher your name. Uh, what do you think about mixed flocks? Well, I have, uh, of course, you could see I have kind of gone um, against the grain a little bit, and I do have a mixed flock. 
Um, I have had uh, chickens, turkeys, ducks, pheasants, chuckers, and quail. Um, basically uh, all at different times and uh, right now in the aviary I have about 50 Caternix quail uh, along with six ring neck pheasants and the one duck. Um, I kept the turkeys in there until they got uh, size on them because at this point they are so large that they could inadvertently uh, kill the quail. Um, so that's why, uh, because by stepping on them or uh, by pecking at them. And uh, so that's why they had to be moved to the other side to completely grow out. Um, right. The duck does get a little crazy and step on quail occasionally, but she has never injured one to my knowledge. Right. Got them big webby feet. Okay, Rochelle Farm says, hello, Tanya and Terry. Hello. Kiki wants to know, what's your new favorite color quail? I still think Pansy B is definitely up there at the top of my favorites. Um, however, the uh, black ones that I got from uh, K-Dale are in my favorites list as well. Yep. I agree. Um, I'm kind of particular to anything with fawn in it, and I'm really right now starting to get into the the, the rugine and trying to learn a little bit about that, how it affects all the different plumages. Um, speaking of William Carl Foster from Kdale, Caternix, um, guys, William lost his father this past week, and uh, so if you can say a prayer for him, if, if that's your thing, um, I'm sure he would appreciate it. Okay, the Bot Bunch says hello from Oregon. Casey Outdoors says hello all. Anita says, uh, FYI to the listeners, I had to close out and reboot to get the light button to work. Huh. That's different. The Roussel Farm says, Kiki, has Tanya said anything to upset anyone yet? <laughs> Uh, let's see, Katrina says, just put 35 golds for my shire and 30 of my own eggs. Uh, parents are jumbo wild and Egyptian for my shire into the brooder. Four more have hatched and are fluffing up in the incubator. More on the way. Well, congratulations. Uh, Katrina says, woohoo for the numbers. Always good to get more people involved. Absolutely. I don't know what this one is. Who is Little Goose Duck? You understand that one? From the Rochelle Farm? Yes, that it's a, a BYC person. Of course. I'll fill him in. <laughs> uh, ben there says hi from Dallas. JL Murphy says congrats. We got 29K here. I think you were less than 1,000 when our homestead first joined. Yeah, I remember back when you joined. Yeah, that was a long time ago. A thousand? Wow. Tim says, I like the content that's over my head. Most of it is right now, but it keeps me learning. Absolutely, I agree 100%. I mean, I've learned so much just from the guests that come on this show. Um, you know, a lot of them have a lot more experience than I do, so I enjoy learning from them, and I would hope everybody else does too, so... Marilyn says hi from North Carolina. Uh, Katrina says the more advanced talks gives us stuff to or gives us things to think about, and you can either use that information or say, "Yeah, that was interesting, but doesn't affect the way I'm doing things." I enjoy the variety. Well, great. And yeah, I mean, we can't we can't just bring you know beginner people on the show because then it would get boring uh, to the people that are past the beginner stage so you kind of got to mix it up a little bit 
Um, I'm working, uh, Anita says, I'm working towards implementing the deep bedding mentioned a few weeks ago. Five inches is definitely not deep enough. I think I talked to you recently about that, Tanya. You said, uh, cause I'm gonna be raising my aviary up eight inches and I'm gonna do yes. the deep litter method under <coughs> that. So yes, hopefully eight again, inches will be uh, enough. What I, was, what I was alluding to with the straw is pine shavings and straw really mat down and get okay. nasty right. um, and require removal. That's why the soil base with the uh, mulch works really, really well. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you could see we're, we're now at a three year mark. They're coming up on the three year mark. Uh, we have a lot of nice soil uh, to remove and use in the garden, which I know you use a lot of your compost for. Garden. I do. I do. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to plow up uh, the garden uh, probably this week to get my winter crop in. Wonderful. Yep. Uh, see, Butch says we raised Caternix back when I was a kid, uh, back around 72, 73, and it's come a long way on the info. Yeah, it has. Um, we used to raise rabbits, or my father did actually. And even back then, you know, back in the 70s, people just didn't want to give away information. I think they thought that it was going to hurt their business or something. So they kind of, you know, kept everything secret back then. Let's see, Casey Outdoors says, wow, I'm from Indiana. <laughs> Beth Reed said, that's the beauty of YouTube. If it's over my head now, I can rewatch it later after I know more. Exactly, and that's what everybody does. You know, they just, you, as you learn, you know, you get out of that beginner stage and uh, you'll be looking for that kind of information. Uh, Marilyn says, I enjoy hearing all levels of information. A person is a beginner for a short period of time. Absolutely. Butch says, fellow Hoosier here. Uh, let's see. Sarah says, can someone explain how the deep bedding method works? That's a good one for you, Tanya. Did you want to take this one, Terry, or? No, you, I want you to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear uh, what I have to say. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the deep litter method, um, it does give them something to kind of burrow into, dig up. It does hold a little bit of the heat as well. Um, gives them a little bit of a break from uh, the elements. Um, and also when used inside in a coop, uh, it basically remains dry and uh, gives them traction as well um, and can be turned over, keeps odor down. There's, there's lots of reasons to uh, use the deep litter method and you can remove and replace as needed more often so that it remains fresh and clean for a longer period of time. A full removal on a deep litter method wouldn't need to be done. Most people do that about once a year in a coop setting. Right. And uh, you get compost from it, which is, like we just said, very healthy for the garden. Yes. Uh, Anita says, beautiful aviary. Thank you. The Rochelle Farm says, geez, phone problems this evening. Now I had to load iPad so I won't miss Mrs. Tanya. And not talking to us. Uh, Nick Doro's in the house, says, hey everyone, sorry I'm late. Had to clean out a quail brooder and get my turkey off my roof. <laughs> Okay, Northwoods Quail says, what do you do when you have 20 degree Fahrenheit weather for a week straight uh, for water? Water tends to freeze fast at that temperature. Uh, well, again, we use a heated water 
Um, so unless we lose power, have a problem, which if that happens, um, we have much larger problems. Uh, but uh, we would have to get the generator hooked up and hope that we didn't have any losses as a result of the power outage. Uh, the heated water tends to work well. Uh, we have, uh, when I had the chickens on the other side, I did have a heated PVC system with the uh, vertical nipples um, where we used a stock tank heater in a drum barrel on the inside of the shed and then fed it with an aquarium pump through the PVC to the nipples. Now we did, during that time, we did have wind chills down into the negative 20s, uh, I think all the way down to negative 30 wind chills. Wow. And uh, even the heated, the heated water held up, but the nipples froze up. And so at that point we had to lock birds inside the coop with a cozy coop heater and we had to, the water was flash freezing we had to change it several times throughout the day so that was kind of an emergency situation that we don't get here as often um, but the uh, I believe you know this type of heated water as long as you have a way to power it it does work well even down in um, I have, uh, there is an article on alternative waters um, on BYC uh, by one of our members that he is actually out in Wyoming and he, uh, for his larger birds, it may not work as well for quail, um, but he actually digs a hole and puts the water tank um, below ground level. And uh, that keeps it from freezing over, uh, even in the, the lower temperature ranges. Hmm, great. Uh, see, J Velmi one says enjoying the tour. Uh, Kiki's got a question: Is the floofer in the aviary? <laughs> What's a floofer? <laughs> uh, well, the a floofer is, uh, in Kiki's case, a uh, mini Rex bunny um, that she has added to her list of animals. Um, <laughs> I have the two floofers that are in cages uh, in with the turkeys and then the guinea pigs would technically qualify as floofers as well and they are in the enclosed sub aviary area that was pictured in there. So yes, I do have floofers in the aviary. <laughs> cool. Northwest Quail says, uh, what do you do for quail and how well will they do at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit without the wind chill? Again, we typically don't get quite that low uh, on straight temperatures, uh, but wind chills do get that low. And like I said, at once it gets down that low, we have to rely on, like I said, do we need uh, extra power from a generator because of a power outage? Um, do we need to uh, uh, double check? And uh, like I said, we basically have to just be prepared for losses um, if they happen when temperatures get that low. I did, um, like I said, it's about, uh, in the really bad wind chills a couple of years ago, we do have variable situations where you know, it can be 40 to 50 degrees and raining during the day and then drop below freezing at night before everything has a chance to dry up. Um, and that is the really dangerous part of my area uh, because I have had uh, at least one quail in the past freeze to the ground mm -hmm. and uh, I lost him as a result. What would you recommend to people that have regular outdoor caging? Like I said, wind breaks, covers, um, you know, having some type of, if you are able to put in a hideaway or dirt box mm -hmm. uh, with 
some type of substrate, dirt, or straw um, that they can get into and kind of huddle up and get warm as well. And get them off the um, wire, maybe? But it's basically maybe. just protection from the wind and the rain and the elements. Right. Okay. Uh, Tanya, this is Little Rochelle Farm. Have any little male quails successfully mated with their turkeys? <laughs> no. But, I um, wouldn't think so. <laughs> my turkeys are temporary residents, and uh, they don't stay in with the uh, with the quail for that long. Okay. Okay. Uh, Klaus says hello, Tanya. I researched your last video to find out, but I didn't. How old are your How old are the quails you're keeping? I love your aviaries. And when can I move? <laughs> um, well, I definitely like to come visit you, Klaus. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm always wanting to uh, see the Netherlands, etc. Um, I have uh, all different ages of quail, and of course, uh, my focus is on uh, color variety. Um, so I have uh, one or two of almost every color available um some of my there's a few of my quail out there that are going on two to three years old possibly um and all the way down to the ones i just hatched this summer that are only a couple of months old have you ever had any of your quail go broody yes uh oh. i've not ever let them hatch go all the way to hatch I've taken the eggs out but I have incubated eggs uh, in fact I think in one of my last hatches uh, they had been sitting on the eggs while I was out of town mm -hmm. and when I came back I candled saw the ones that were still viable and popped them in the incubator until they hatched right. that's something I want to try in my aviary that's made one of the main reasons I built it I want to try to get a couple birds to go broody. Northwood Quail says, how long have you been raising quail? Uh, I started raising quail uh, Thanksgiving of 2018, I believe. Okay. Uh, Katrina wants to know if you've had any disease issues with so many species sharing the same space. If not, what do you attribute that to? I've been lucky that I have not encountered any of the issues um, with diseases jumping from species to species. Uh, again, I've been very lucky. I started with chickens and, uh, you know, I've never had any type of major disease in any of my birds. Um, and uh, my quail were temporarily housed with chickens. I, uh, the last of my silkies actually uh, served as broodies for several quail eggs in my uh, first year of having the aviary. And um, again, no major issues. Uh, I'm sure that's attributed to number one, you know, where I source my eggs and all of my stock from. And uh, the fact that I am in a, a neighborhood I've not been keeping birds for very long, and luckily there was no disease present in the soil prior to me bringing the birds in. Okay. Uh, Northwood Quail says, how many quail have you raised in total? Uh, several hundred now. Um, <laughs> I was uh, probably, I think in one year, I hatched over 250. Of course, I'm, I don't hatch on a large scale. I am a backyard hobbyist, um, but I hatched about 250. Uh, at my highest number in the aviary, I had over 100 birds. Wow. Um, and that <clears throat> was this past summer because I had a few stellar hatches and kept growing and growing and growing. I've currently got it back down to around 50 birds. I'm hoping to get down to 30 to 40 to over the winter. And, um, but mm, I average about 60 birds 
year round. Okay. Butch says this is a beautiful setup. Thank you. And N4B1K1 says exactly how many species of birds do you have in your aviary? Um, are your guinea pigs and rabbits in there too? You have guinea pigs, huh? <laughs> yes, uh, my uh, my middle son brought home three guinea pigs uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, when we got tired of them being in his bedroom, we moved them out to the uh, the middle aviary um, with the uh, parakeets. Uh, I currently have four, uh, I've got turkeys, duck, pheasants, and Caternix quail in the main aviary space. Um, and then on the inside uh, heated area, I have one button quail, uh, 16 parakeets, budgies, and then uh, the three guinea pigs. Okay. Kiki says hi, Mr. Muddy. Kiki says hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, Anita says those are sweet hideaways. Uh, J Bell Me One says I use a large plastic storage tote, cut long ways as a hideaway slash windbreaker. Okay. Katrina says, do the quail actually burrow or do they dig down only? I've seen them dig down into the deep bedding and use it as a dust bath, uh, then they hang out there. Uh, yeah, they, they do burrow in and dig down. Um, I have had them uh, make pretty large holes uh, in the ground and things as well. And they do uh, kind of dig around and burrow up under the straw when I put it out there. Uh, they can dig up plants, dust bathing around them. I've had them uh, take out more than one. That's why you may have seen in the uh, the hibiscus that I have planted out there currently. We have all of those boxed in now with lava rock and uh, they can still move the lava rock around and well the duck and the pheasants do mostly but if they make a hole the quail will get in there and continue the digging uh, right. to dust space. Yeah mine I had four inches of soil on top of a concrete slab they got right down to the concrete the first day. <laughs> uh, the Bot Bunch says, sorry if you covered this, but how do you predator proof? So we, uh, uh, of course, we have the eight foot fencing um, around the sides. And then I have a hardware cloth as well as a heavy duty aviary netting. Um, this netting has been very effective in keeping out most predators. Um, I, uh, you know, kind of laugh at the hawks because they'll fly down and uh, think they're going to go into the netting and they basically bounce off like a trampoline. Um, we also, we did have, before we installed the heavy duty netting, we did have uh, raccoons get into the aviary and kill several birds. And so we also have uh, an electric fence perimeter around the top portion of the aviary, the top part of the fence, uh, to further deter predators. And then a large portion of the aviary has about a 12 inch deep concrete footer on the perimeter um, where we had it, we had installed that previously when it was a pen for our dogs to keep them from digging out. Now it serves as a predator proofing to keep predators from digging in. Right. Cool. Uh, Maria says, have you tried sand instead of dirt? Uh, well, the, uh, the budgie aviary is actually a mixture of sand and pea gravel as their substrate. Mm -hmm. um, 
I do add sand like to the uh, little dust bath area out there, um, but I've never attempted to fill the entire aviary space with, with sand because of drainage issues as uh, well as just the amount of sand that would have to be loaded and carried back there. Alrighty. Klaus says, how long does it take for you to find their eggs? Also, are you keeping them with other animals such as chicks or ducks? Uh, any aggression? Uh, well, that's part of keeping a mixed flock is you do have to be prepared for the consequences if you do get aggressive birds. Um, and I have lost some birds to aggressive issues in the past. Uh, as far as the egg collection, it can get interesting sometimes, but um, quail typically get into the habit of finding a certain spot and laying there every day, day in and day out. And once one lays, then they all will go and lay there. Um, so uh, the hardest part is uh, a lot of them like to lay their eggs under that coop. Mm -hmm. And so I have to sometimes climb down or get a net, something to retrieve the eggs out from underneath there. Um, but I, uh, this past summer, I was getting in at anywhere from a dozen and a half to three dozen eggs per day. Oh, cool. Uh, Katrina basically asked the same thing. How do you find all the eggs with all that straw? If yours are like mine, they lay all over. <laughs> Well, the straw goes out there um, basically when they're done laying. Like I said, I have not collected a quail egg in several, in probably a month and a half, two months now. The other issue that I encountered this year is I was collecting less eggs because if I don't get out there and collect them quickly enough, uh, the duck will go around and collect them for me and put them <laughs> right into her belly. All right. Uh, Beth says, do you keep supplemental lights on your quail or do they take the winter off? And I think you just answered that. Uh, well, I do. Uh, I had, I have rope lights around the aviary. Some of them are, have gone out over the years, so they are due to be replaced. Um, but I also have <coughs> lots of lighting in our backyard in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I have found that it's not enough lighting to continue uh, the laying behavior. So regardless of supplemental lighting because of the in, uh, the seasonal environment of keeping them in the aviary, I've not been successful in getting eggs year round. Right. When, when do they start laying again? Uh, usually around uh, April. Oh, okay. uh, it, again, it depends on the warm up and right. the days. Uh, JL Murphy says, Tanya, I'm happy to say that I don't have your issues with temperatures anymore. Um, at what temperature would you say you start preparing for winter? Um, with all that loose straw, how do you find the eggs? Again, when it goes I, on sale after Halloween. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, basically I, uh, I watch the weather and, you know, I don't start getting really concerned with getting prepared until they start forecasting first frost um, because again you know like we had freezing temps last week it didn't get I mean even though it got below freezing it didn't stay below freezing long enough to cause a huge issue um, mm -hmm. water thawed out as soon as the sun came out and it warmed up a little bit um, things like that uh, so I still hooked up the uh, waterer. Um, I did not have the straw out, so I basically waited until I knew I was doing this show and got out there and, and really got the winterization done. Um, but it's, like I said, it's mainly about when it gets really cold and the hard freezes, etc., giving them a break. Uh, Marie says, do your quails get mites from having uh, dirt bedding? Uh, we were concerned uh, about the possibility that they may have had 
mites or other pests because we have a we have a really big problem with midges here, no sims, whatever you call them in your area. And so, you know, during the summer months and all of that, I keep fly traps out there. Um, we did buy some barn lime that we were going to uh, mix in with the aviary soil. Um, but now that things are starting to get colder outside, mm -hmm. Um, we're not having as much of a bug problem per se out there. Okay. And Kiki commented that dirt does not cause mites. Okay. Summer says greetings from Texas. Um, uh, ben says, uh, do quail do well on a sprouted barley diet? Um, I, I believe in a uh, good, whole, um, high quality feed as their main diet. Um, I, uh, a lot of people do sprouted greens as diet uh, or as supplements to diet. Um, I've only had a few sprouted greens uh, you know, a few times when the parakeet seed and things like that has uh, has sprouted in the corners, um, but mine uh, it's mainly ninety percent of game bird feed. I use uh, currently use Tombach block razor, um, which is around a twenty percent protein, which seems to work well for all of the birds, even you know my layers. And uh, then they get treats usually daily. Um, I spread about one cup of a mixture of a five grain uh, scratch mix, um, about 50 50 mix with dried mealworms, and I give that to them every afternoon. And then we do add fresh greens and things throughout the year, um, but that mainly goes on a daily basis to the guinea pigs and the, and the parakeets. Okay. Uh, Michael Perry says, fixing to get started raising quail, or raising some quail here in Central Florida in the next month or two. Any idea anywhere down here I can buy eggs when I'm 100% ready? Uh, there's a lot of breeders, um, Michael, that will ship to you. Um, one of our sponsors, Southwest Game Birds. Uh, you can check uh, Kansas City Quail. You can check My Shire Farm. Um, all of them will ship. Uh, and in the in the winter, I've really never had any issues getting eggs into Florida. Um, in summer now, I've had issues. They're just too hot sometimes. But uh, yeah, there, there's quite a few breeders out there. Just check around. Klaus wants to know what ratio are you keeping in there? I guess you're male. Again, ratio. that's variable. I uh, I try to keep a one to five. Um, but anybody that has seen my backyard videos in the summertime, um, my male to female ratio can get out of hand occasionally, <laughs> and uh, I have to go out there and uh, rework the numbers. Uh, Terrence Johnson says hello from Motor City, Detroit. Kiki wants to know, is that fatso? Barking, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, BFLSU77 says checking in from, wow, I'm not going to get that one, Opalousis, Opalousis, Louisiana. Gloria is in from Bishopville, South Carolina. Welcome. Yeah, Katrina's talking to Jasmine, saying I'm excited to see how your refrigerator is working out. Um, that's going to be part of the topic when Jasmine comes on the show uh, two weeks from today. So she does have an amazing looking uh, incubator that they built. I'm kind of envious, but I don't have enough birds to, to need anything that big. Um, let's see. Oh, you're not talking to me. <coughs> 
Rob Moore says, Troy, Alabama here. Can you do all sand floor um, if keeping quail on the ground? Again, that would that would have to do with the area that you live in, um, any drainage, and also the size, ease of getting the sand in there. But um, yes, you could choose to use sand as a, a flooring material. Okay. Uh, Terry Kennedy says, hello from Alabama. Got my first eggs from Southwest Game Birds in the incubator now. Congratulations. Good luck on the hatch. Uh, Boreal says, what is your egg collection per day, please? Uh, again, it's, it's variable depending on how many birds I have uh, during the time. I mainly get my eggs uh, between April and October uh, for the most part once the days start getting shorter and it's also dependent on if I <coughs> get to the eggs before the duck does. Um, but again, it is uh, uh, about a dozen and a half to three dozen eggs a day. Nice. Which is way more than we can eat as a, as a family. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Tim says hello from Wrightsville, Georgia. Hello, Tim. Let's see. Skynet's in the house. Uh, what could we use on snowpack or ice for a little traction for outdoor quail? Again, I, I really have been happy with the mulch um, over the dirt. Uh, I have seen videos, I was, uh, you know, saying that I did purchase some barn lime. I have seen, you know, a few videos on YouTube where people actually put those in their uh, chicken runs uh, to give more traction as well. Okay. Uh, Beth Reed says, my turkey males are big enough that I worry a bit for my turkey hens. They don't have access to my quail and I plan to move them away from the chickens come spring. Sorry to hear about uh, K Dale's loss. Yep. Uh, Tracy says, Good evening, all from Ohio. Kiki says, Sorry to hear, William. Beth also says, So sorry to hear about William's dad. Uh, Klaus says, In your aviary, do you have only perennials or do you plant also some annuals to create some more shade? Have you had a broody hen and any luck? Uh, yes, well, I, I alluded earlier, um, I have had hens go broody, uh, but I typically they get bored with it basically because they have so much space to move around. And like I said, I'm out there daily interacting with them with treats, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, uh, the closest I've gotten is they've sat on them for the first week or so, and then I've candled, uh, removed any eggs that didn't get cracked or broken um, from the other birds going in and out to the same area, mm -hmm. and uh, put them in the incubator and hatch them successfully. Um, I did put several eggs under silkies when I still had silky hens, and they incubated them. I actually hatched a couple, but due to the size difference, and my setup, uh, they uh, crushed a couple of chicks. So again, I would let them stay <coughs> broody sit until a few days before they were due to hatch, and then I would actually hatch them in the incubator. Mm -hmm. um, I do plant a mixture. Uh, again, this is the first year that we've done the, the larger hibiscus. So I don't know yet if it's going to survive um, there. A lot of the shade, uh, they use the snowball bush. And I have another tree on the turkey side that gives a little bit of shade. Um, and then I have used canopies and tents and things like that as additional shade in the past. Um, but I've never had anything quite large enough um, that they haven't destroyed for them to get under um, as well. 
I uh, have a lot of annuals planted in pots and things outside the aviary, um, but I'm not sure if it showed in any of my photos, my hanging pots that are inside the aviary, I actually ended up having to fill with plastic plants mm. um, because the pheasants, one of the female pheasants was jumping up and eating the plants out of the pots. Okay. Uh, Jesse said, what, what inspired you to put your quail in an aviary and any tips for getting started with it? Uh, well, you can still see the remnants of my original design. Um, and uh, if you go back to my original video with Terry, I go a little bit more in depth about how we built the aviary. Um, if I had it to do over again and when I upgrade my current setup, I am going to use the wire supports. Steel cable supports. Yeah, steel cable supports all right. the way around and uh, remove the remnants of the original PVC frame. Okay. Um, Charles says, uh, with an aviary setup, how difficult is egg collection? Do they lay all over the place? And can you direct their laying behavior to certain areas? Yes, we do try to uh, direct their laying behavior inside the hideaways, etc. That doesn't always work. Um, but in general, they uh, most of them lay eggs either under the coop or around the perimeter. So, you know, just walking around you it is pretty easy to spot the quail eggs um, and so it it doesn't really take me very long to collect eggs uh, mm -hmm. because I just grab them and put them in the, the snack pocket. snack bucket or a pocket or whatever as I'm walking around doing the other feed. Okay Casey Outdoor says I just ordered some I think that's supposed to be pearl Quaternix eggs Quaternix quail eggs what if you think what do you think of them and I guess I don't need a permit to keep them uh, exactly the uh, uh, in most states I think with the exception of <coughs> I don't know what I mean, um, you do not need a permit to keep Quaternix quail um, pearl is a very nice color uh, it is one of my favorites. I, I think I only have a couple of that color left out there. I haven't hatched them in a while, but um, it's definitely a color I would hatch again. Okay, Courtney says, I really need to know the best food to order online for my quail chicks uh, that I'm about to incubate. Not a clue. Any suggestions? Uh, as I said, I uh, am currently using Calmback. K-A-L-M-B-A-C-H and I'm using the Flock Razor Crumble. Um, I uh, typically <clears throat> use this from day one uh, all the way through um, with all of my different birds. Uh, I do grind it, grind it up in a food processor to be smaller um, and I've been ordering mine from Chewy.com. Um, a 50 pound bag is about 30, between 30 and 35 dollars and delivered to your doorstep. Okay. Ryan says hello from Magnolia, Texas. Uh, a bunch of people asking, answering his questions. Uh, Brian says anything besides supplemental lighted, lighting needed to keep them laying through the winter? Again, it's, it's basically environment and supplemental lighting. Um, I believe it's 14 to 16 hours uh, that you will need to make sure your supplemental lighting is on a, a timer and consistent. And a lot of people have very good luck with that method in keeping their quail light. Okay. okay um, Brandon says, I just got into quail. Why is it not working? I just got into quail a couple months ago. I borrowed an incubator and ordered eggs. My quail have been laying for a week now, and I'm almost, I'm already, and I'm already put more eggs in the incubator. Do you think they'll hatch? If they're fertile, they should. 
yeah, again, it, uh, most people recommend waiting about two weeks after their first eggs to make sure you, that they're fertile. Um, mm -hmm. You can check that by cracking one open and looking for the bullseye. <coughs> uh, or you can use the method that you're doing is just put them in the incubator, candle them, and see what happens. Yep. Uh, Anita says, I have 21 birds at the moment in my quail tractor. Uh, it's 36 square feet. If I add another eight inches of bedding, will that be sufficient? One birds in 36 square feet. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, again, it's acceptable in a tractor setting. It's probably a, a little too crowded for my preference, um, but the eight inches of bedding um, should be helpful, definitely. Uh, Allie from Maine's Confetti Quail Farms in the house. Welcome, Allie. She's probably at school right now, but thanks for checking in. Um, not talking to me. Matthew Simpson says it's getting cold in West Virginia. The Rochelle Farm says, Tanya, you said your vertical nipples froze up, but... Did you try that same setup with the horizontal nipples? Uh, no, I uh, I never tried the uh, horizontal nipples. I considered it, um, but we basically, uh, when we moved everybody out to the aviary, we did not want to run the uh, PVC watering system that distance. So <coughs> I uh, just went back to traditional waters. Will okay. the water in the holding tank wouldn't get Yeah, and uh, it was the, the holding tank would have to be treated um, because they weren't going through it that much. And then the uh, temperature with the heater was uh, variable. Um, so lots of reasons that I chose not to continue with that system. Okay. Kiki says she hears baby quailies. Oh, she probably hears, I've got a brooder over here full of a uh, bunch of pansies that just hatched out. Yeah, I was going to say, that has to be on your end. I don't have any baby <laughs> birds in my house right now. Uh, Judy says, my quail love the fresh pumpkins from my garden. I cut into slices and they just love it. Uh, that's amazing. I uh, I put the pumpkin out there, and the uh, the quail wouldn't really uh, have anything to do with it. They were uh. half scared of it. Um, the turkey stripped the seeds out of the inside, but left most of the pumpkin. And the uh, guinea pigs and the rabbits wouldn't touch the pumpkin at all. Yeah, mine used to to love. We'd scoop out the guts out of a pumpkin or squash or anything. I'd throw that in there. They'd tear it up. Okay, Jonathan says, how do you improvise or what kind of feed do you improvise with when the regular feeds are not available? Uh, again, I've not had uh, too much trouble not being able to find feed at all. Um, again, I have changed. Uh, I was using meat bird uh Country Roads brand from uh, Rural King. Um, uh, then before switching to Chewy and using the Comeback brand. Uh, you can also get uh, several good options at uh, Tractor Supply that you cannot get other places. And then in a pinch, uh, Mana Pro has a game bird, show bird uh, food that can be ordered off of Amazon as well. All right. Okay. Uh, Nick says, "How large is your? How large in total is your aviary, both indoors and out?" I'm looking to build a 10 by 20 aviary on the side of my house. <clears throat> so I was wondering, how many square feet do you give each species? Well, I, uh, because I run a mix, um, my aviary is actually uh, seven, 
17 to 18 by 37 feet, um, just the, the quail part. And then I have about another eight by 15 feet or so in the turkey rabbit area. Um, and then the uh, indoor pergola space is Yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe it's four by six on the outdoor portion and uh, five, five by five on the indoor room. Uh, so uh, I basically give the quail have plenty of square foot per bird. That's not mm. an issue. You but, have two hundred birds. Um, yeah, if I just had quail, I could have you know three four hundred birds. Uh, but because I have pheasants as well, I give the pheasants all uh, about 15 feet per bird um, and uh, allow for the different size of the different species. But um, they all seem to be very happy with the amount of space that they have at my current numbers. Okay. Everybody's saying that they hear the chicks over here chirping. <laughs> JL Murphy says, so with so many different species in the same space, is there any interspecies fighting? Uh, yes and no. Um, we have our, our issues in the springtime when breeding season starts. <coughs> uh, if I don't have it, my numbers down to one male pheasant, um, the, uh, dominant male pheasant usually does fine with everyone but the younger one will uh, cause trouble with my quail he has you know killed an injured quail um, in the past if I don't get him removed he also uh, um, that's why I have just the one button on the inside is because during the beginning of breeding season he actually killed my uh, male and female button quail Wow. They'll mate with whatever's available. Yeah. yeah, they'll basically try to mate with whatever's available because they don't understand that they're not all the same species. Right. Uh, Katrina says, was it your video I saw a while ago that you had a gate latch locked with a carabiner? Um, I have them on mine now. How has that been working for you? Raccoons haven't figured it out yet, question mark. Yeah, the, uh, the carabiner lock uh, has worked really well for me. Um, again, before I started using the carabiner lock, I had already used the um, electric fencing as well. Um, and the type of gate latch that I have is easy for a raccoon to open, uh, but with the carabiner on there, it makes it much more difficult so I've, I've not had any issues with that. I trap mm -hmm. out the raccoons. Yeah, and we, we started setting uh, traps if we, at the first sign of raccoon to uh, get rid of them before they find their way into the ADR. All right. Um, Anita has a suggestion for them laying under your shelters. Uh, use a tray like I use for under my, you know, the manure trays I use. Put one of them in there with your with your uh, bedding on it. And then you could slide the tray out, collect your eggs. Yeah, so far. that would, uh, would be an idea, definitely. Yep. Uh, Tanya Faraway Farm says, do you ever sneak in more quail without the hubby knowing? <laughs> and if so, what are your tricks if he starts to question if there's more than normal? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, he usually... I'm going to uh, hide all the yeah, he usually <laughs> figures it out when he sees me, uh, you know, checking the incubator um, to see that there's more eggs in there. But, uh, yeah, I usually let him in on the secret, but uh, I have been under a hatching ban for uh, a few months now <laughs> um, because my numbers have been a little out of control. All right. Uh, Lisa says, Lisa how much feed do you go through in a month to feed your aviary, everyone in your aviary? Uh, with the turkeys out there, I have been uh, going through 
50 plus pounds a week. Okay. So um, I, uh, I have my orders set from Chewy to deliver 100 pounds every two weeks. And uh, there's been a couple of situations where I've had to go pick up an extra 50 pound bag from Rural King because I cut it too close. Uh, Marilyn says, do you raise your own mealworms? No, I haven't gotten into that yet. I just buy the great big bag, uh, uh, the big bag of the five green scratch along with a big bag of dried mealworms while I'm uh, at Rural King, um, I typically uh, buy that about <coughs> once or twice a month uh, for the birds um, when I'm there doing my other shopping, and I uh, mix them together myself and uh, take take them out to the aviary when I can. Okay. Judy says hello from Abilene, Texas. I have my quail in an aviary. I uh, use totes upside down with a hole cut out. My treat for quail is fresh pumpkin slices, one in season. Love the show. Thank you, Judy. Appreciate you coming in. Kiki says, I'm not hearing this part about daily treats. No, ma'am, I didn't hear it. <laughs> uh, Kiki is very anti-treat. It's okay. uh, basic feed only. Gotcha. Uh, Corey says, hello from Brigham City, Utah. Hello and welcome, Corey. Jonathan Jonathan says, morning from Nigeria. Wow, that's cool. Uh, Rinchicio Ranch. I don't know if I butchered your name. Sorry about that. Um, I just joined. Are they noisy? Can I keep in my backyard? I have three chickens and three Pekings. Uh, I can tell you the Pekin duck is way louder than any of the quail. Um, she is uh, very talkative, very vocal, and very noisy. Um, and uh, yeah, if you go out anywhere in the backyard, she starts yelling for treats immediately. <laughs> uh, the quail only get uh, noisy when my male to female ratio gets out of hand and I've got too many crowing at one time. Um, sometimes summer evenings, it can get pretty loud out there. Uh, but again, one or two males on a property are not gonna make that much noise. Uh, the, uh, the pheasants, again, they, uh, their crow is loud, um, but it's a natural crow versus the crow of a, a chicken rooster. Right. And uh, so it's, and they, they only do it once or twice a day. So it's not as annoying as other types of birds. Okay. Uh, I want, also want to know, uh, can they keep in Illinois? I'm sure you can. Uh, yes. Uh, as far as I know, there's no permit necessary for Turnix quail in Illinois. Okay. Everybody talking about how loud their birds are. Uh, Matthew says, what are your thoughts on feed fermentation? Uh, I've never done fermented feed. Um, again, my only uh, experience or knowledge about it is from, uh, I believe you have some videos on it, Terry. I do. Uh, and uh, people talking about it on, on Facebook and other, other areas, but never okay. something that I really got into. Yeah, I'm, when I'm in full production... Um, I'll ferment uh, crumbles, and it's, it seems one if you get the chick started on crumbles, they love it. Uh, take the adults; it takes a little bit longer, but once that once they figure out, oh, this is food, then they they tear it up. But it's it's an awful lot of work. Um, just to a lot of people say that the fermented feed is a little more beneficial to them. I'm not really finding that, um, but you know, I like to do the video, so I got to test everything out. <laughs> Uh, Judy says, I had my frizzle bantam hatch two clutches of my Caternix quail eggs, but she was not able to raise them, so she had to take over raising them. Okay. Uh, Beth Reed says, check with uh, Game and Fish to find out for sure. Any thoughts on wet mash? 
Um, again, I uh, I try to start them on dry feed, and I go above and beyond to try to keep my feed from getting wet. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, not not something that my birds really like. Okay, the husband heard, LOL, he said, you better not, I'm cut off. <laughs> Joe, Joel DeHaan says, I made it, hello from Idaho. What are you doing in here? My dog just walked in. Uh, Jonathan said, how often do you change out your breeders? Again, I, uh, I have birds of all ages, and I basically... Uh, choose who I'm keeping um, first based on color, personality, um, you know, I don't want the color variety to get too light, I don't want it to get too dark, um, and I like having some of the more rare colors. Uh, you know, some of the birds are a lot more friendly than the other ones, and so they've been allowed to stay around much, much longer um, because of their personalities. Um, I get very upset if I get a group of birds that is flushing and flying all the time. Every time I walk out there, it seems to get worse this time of year. Um, and so, uh, typically when that happens, I start taking out the birds that are flushing more, um, versus the ones that are, again, more calm and docile. Right. And then, of course, male to female ratio plays a part as well. Sure. Birds and Beyond says, good evening. Love from Texas. Welcome to the show. And Alyssa G says, great show this evening, everyone. Really enjoyed learning about your keeping practices and time for nighttime chores. Uh, Nick says, what are some of the different ways you sell your quail eggs, or do you have a side business with your quail? Uh, again, I've uh, mainly done this as a hobby and for personal use. I have uh, you know, sold a, a few adults, um, a few eggs, and uh, a couple of batches of chicks, but I don't really put it out there as uh, you know, heavily advertised. Um, so we just, uh, you know, use everything ourselves or give it away, things like that. Right. Okay. Uh, Kiki says, I plead the fifth. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, okay, Jasmine Bass says, great to learn from you tonight, Tanya. I have been, do been doing homestead chores and cooking dinner tonight, so that's why I was quiet. Uh, Birds and Beyond wants to know what's a good male to female ratio? I prefer, you know, one to four, one to five, anything um, in that one to four to one to six area. It still gives you uh, good fertility rates, but also keeps the peace a little bit better because you don't have as much aggression and fighting, overbreeding, etc. Especially with winter coming, uh, we have to be very careful because, uh, you know, with overbreeding, they lose a lot of the feathers on their head, which means that they can't keep themselves as warm and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't have the uh, patience or the talent to knit little uh, toboggan caps for each of the female quails. So. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina says, thank you for all the good information. Um, Beth wants to know, what do you do with your culls? Um, are you eating them? Uh, yes, we basically, um, when we do a, a removal batch, we typically take out anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 quail at a time and uh, process them to put in our own freezer. If we find something off in the, the process, if I've had a sick one or one that just failure to thrive, et cetera, too small right. um, to use for meat for ourselves, then that usually goes to the dogs. Okay. Jonathan wants to know what's my dog's name and breed. Uh, his name's Red, and he's a Lab Shepherd mix. And our, my wife's dog's a little poodle, and her name's Tilly. 
Uh, let's see. Nick says, thank you for your time answering all of our questions. Lots of super, lots of super useful information this evening. Um, Birds and Beyond says, thank you. Kiki says, Tater, Tater is a fatty patty bulldog. <laughs> and she's dumb. <laughs> Uh, birds yeah, and beyond. They, yes, I have uh, the the dogs barking on my end. Is oh. I have an English bulldog named Tater, and then I have my two uh, squirrel hunting dogs. They're mountain feists. Gotcha. And so uh, that's that's who's making all the noise here. Gotcha. Birds and Beyond says, "Do you inc incubate the eggs?" I think she's talking to you. Yes, I uh, I do incubate. Um, some of my own eggs as well as sourcing from uh, other breeders. Uh, okay. Most of my birds are um, from my Shire eggs. Um, then I have my homegrowns and then uh, the blacks and a couple of the other ones are Kdale. Okay. Um, okay, that brings us down to the bottom of the questions. Um, Thank you guys for all the great questions. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Tanya. Um, I do want to go ahead real quick and read off the uh, winners for the 20, or the Congrats 20K celebration. <clears throat> Vicki Kenton uh, was the first winner. She's going to get a Caternix Corner Live Tumblr. Joanne King is going to get 30 mixed hatching eggs from Southwest Game Birds. And Herbie Johnson we'll get a $50 gift certificate from uh, Hatching Time to use on their website. So all of the winners, either email me at terry at caternixcorner.com um, with your shipping information and your email address and whatnot, and we'll get that stuff out to you right away. I'll also post this over on uh, Facebook, just in case you guys aren't with us tonight. <clears throat> so again, I want to thank... Uh, Beth, for moderating. Tanya, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you have a busy schedule over there, but... Uh, I, I really appreciate you having me on again, Terry. And, always uh, a pleasure. I will uh, be happy to answer uh, any additional questions that come up. I'm not sure. Do you, do you post... Uh, you don't post anything when the video goes back up on YouTube, do you? But... The they can actually after after the live is over they can comment in the uh, down below the video okay. it'll be it'll be and, there immediately afterwards so they okay. can comment and there and of course I, I'm on uh, Caternix Corner quite often I check it a couple of times a day probably and I'll be happy to answer any additional questions there okay um, again thank you guys for all the questions uh, don't forget to join us next week. Klaus from uh, Paradise Quail is going to be here. We're going to be talking about the Celadon gene and some issues that might be arising from that. Um, I got a feeling it's going to be a little bit of a controversial subject, but I think that you guys need to hear this. It's a lot of good information, and you guys can make up your own minds afterwards. So, um, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tanya. And don't forget to contact me either here or over on Facebook or by YouTube, and we'll get all the prizes sent out. So everyone have a good night, and we'll see you next week. And let me see if I can figure out how to shut this thing off.